Hey, welcome back to the Naval News segment. Uh, today we're going to begin with USNI News. Our good friend H.I. Sutton has teamed up with Sam Legrone to fight crime and tell good news stories. Uh, today we're going to be talking about the uh, test range that China built in the far western deserts of China. And uh, uh, some satellite imagery has come to, to the public and it looks like they've been building uh, mock targets that look like American naval vessels. So uh, we'll see what these two experts have to say, and then I'll add in my two cents here at the end. But H.I. Sutton and Sam Legrone write, China builds missile targets shaped like U.S. aircraft carrier destroyers in a remote desert. And here's a close-up of the picture here. This is obviously a satellite picture looking down on it. You can see how it closely resembles the deck plan of a United States uh, aircraft carrier. Photos courtesy of Maxar Satellite Services. All right, the Chinese military has built targets in the shape of an American aircraft carrier and other U.S. warships in the Taklamekan uh, Desert as part of a new target range complex, according to photos provided by USNI News from Maxar. Uh, the full-scale outline of U.S. carrier as and at least two Arleigh Burke destroyers are part of a test range that has been built in the Rokang region of central China. Uh, the site is near a former target range China used to test earlier versions of the so-called carrier killer uh, DF-21 Delta anti-ship ballistic missile, according to press reports. Uh, but this new range shows China continues to focus on anti-carrier capabilities with an emphasis on U.S. Navy warships. Uh, unlike the Iranian aircraft carrier shaped target in the Persian Gulf, this new facility shows signs of sophisticated instrument mints on the target range so here if you zoom in on what looks like an early burke to me you can see that they've got the little gun with the little vls right here some superstructures and funnels and helipad and here's the range instrumentation that he's talking about so the range instrumentation will you know obviously capture high speed images of the weapons terminal phase uh including uh t telemetry not just photos uh, and so these, this, this instrumentation is very important in analyzing and improving a uh, weapons performance. So this is, this is meant to be used, you know, multiple times, I believe. Uh, the asymmetrical lines in this section is a clear evidence that it represents a U.S. Arleigh Burke vessel. That's what H.I. Sutton writes. And I would agree. I mean, if you just look at it clearly, Arleigh Burke. Some vertical poles here, you can see the shadows of them, uh, maybe for high-speed sensors, cameras, and radar deflectors. So they're going to try and spoof their own missiles and see how uh, ECM and chaff perform against them in, in an effort to make them better. It's very similar to what we do, except we don't go through all this. You know, we usually shoot uh, containers. Uh, every time I've seen a range uh, going, if we don't have a mock-up of like a vehicle, which is very simple, not in a whole ship like this, we'll just shoot a bunch of containers with tomahawks or whatnot. Uh, I wonder if they're trying to send a message because they know that we would find out about this. I mean, we have satellites, right? So I wonder if they're saying, hey, you know, we're, we're, we're getting ready for you. This could be like a literally a shot across the bow, you know, by making them look like American ships. In other words, I'm saying whether this ship shape here is like an early Burke or if it's just a bunch of containers stacked in a way that has superstructure like an early Burke, um, yeah, I imagine they'd get very similar information, but they're essentially making mock-ups. But it gets better. Um, there's one here that's on rails. Yeah, look at this one. So, see this red line? This is a rail. Think of it like a railway for a, for a train that one of the mock-ups, I believe it's one of the early Burks, actually drives on so they can practice hitting moving targets as it changes course here. And so this gives you an idea of the scale of this range, this satellite photo. This is a huge desert and looks like possibly a salt plain up here. And this is in central China. And they, uh, they, they have these targets. They move in straight lines. They move in sinusoidal lines. And, uh, yep. And, oh, okay, so here's the aircraft carrier. Obviously, it's not on the track. And here's a destroyer target. So this must be uh, a different ship here. Very interesting. It's very sophisticated to have like a rail that's this long. Who knows how many miles that is? It looks extremely long to me. Um, back to the piece, they write, the area has been traditionally used for ballistic missile testing. According to a summary of Maxar Imageries uh, from geospatial intelligence company, All Source Analysis. I'll have to check them out. I wonder if I can get a subscription to them. I'll bring you guys even more photos if I can. Uh, the mock-ups of several 
probable U.S. warships, along with other warships mounted on rails and mobile, could simulate targets related to seeking target and uh, acquisition testing. Uh, that would make sense. Yeah. Can it, can it maintain track of a target that's moving? It's very important when you're trying to shoot a ship, because even if the ship is stationary, the ocean's going to move it around a little bit. Um, analysis of historical satellite images show that the carrier's target structure was first built in March and April of 2019, underwent several rebuilds, and then was dismantled in December 2019. So it's not their first attempt to do this, but it looks like they finally got it right. And here you can see the trails or the railroad tracks. They've got a big uh, rail here and a rail here. It's a six meter or 20 foot rail system. So that's 20 feet between each of these rails. Very impressive. And it looks like the rail goes right to this assembly building here. I'm assuming that's assembly building. And then they have some um, other buildings here. So they build it, they put it on this rail, and they wheel it down. This, I guess they could put anything on this. This is just like a barge. And you could make any shape you want on top of this thing. And then send it through the desert on the rails. Now, the real news here is that they're using American mock-ups of, uh, of American warships. And then practicing potentially their uh, anti-carrier killer uh, missile on it, the DF-21D. So DF-21D has a range of over 800 nautical miles. I'm going to show you how they use it here in just a second. I just want to see if they have any more interesting information before we move on to that. Here on November 5th, this is just a few days ago, Capellan Space Synthetic Aperture Radar shows the same thing. See if we get, can we get any more details here? Not really. You just kind of get the outline of the, uh, of the target. Keep in mind, this one's not mobile. This is a stationary target. It's the other one that's mobile. Oh, and then it's just showing you the range of different different missiles. Uh, where's the DF-26? There's that one. Where's the anti-ship cruise missiles? Okay, so this, you know, orange line here, if you want to call it that, that's the range. And that well encompasses, you know, most of the Philippines all the way down through the South China Sea. Yeah. Now, how, how, how do they employ this missile? This I'm talking about specifically the carrier killer right here. This is one way of doing it. This is the H-6 bomber. This is kind of like uh, it's a ripoff of a Russian bomber, but they've updated it. Like uh, it, it's, it's very similar to the Badger. And the old Badger bomber was kind of a medium speed, medium bomber that the Russians used in the Cold War. Uh, they, they, they haven't used them for a long time. I believe they're out of commission by now. But that's kind of what this looks like just at first glance. And uh, these are all the different weapons that this, this one bomber can employ, uh, including this very cool, this is a recon drone down here at the bottom. But I want you to pay attention to this one here. This is the carrier killing hypersonic capable, but doesn't have to be. Um, weapon uh number 45 let's see doo, 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 here it is yeah it's the anti-ship ballistic missile the anti-ship ballistic missile or the df-21 is right here it's it's air launch capable it's like the largest air launched missile like ever created thing is huge these things are normally on uh transport erector launchers tels but this one can be um you know mounted to the belly of this plane and then launched. Obviously, if you do that, you can greatly increase the range because you're already starting airborne and you can actually fly the plane, you know, out over the South China Sea before you begin the, the, the engagement. But this is one of the delivery systems that they would most likely use. Uh, and just look at the variety of weapons, including hypersonic uh, glide vehicles. This thing can launch. It's called the H-6 bomber. Um, I should probably do a detailed, you know, look at this plane someday, but uh, I just want to give you an idea of, of what they're, uh, what they're capable of. Here is an actual photograph of that reconnaissance drone that it can drop off. Here you can see the mounts. So, you know, they can mount it under the chassis. They uh, drop it like they would any other ammunition. And then it's got some rockets back here where it can uh, do sustained flight for long periods of time. This is the, uh, the rocket drone. All right. And so why is this important? Why, why, why are we even talking about this? Well, if we look at uh, navalnews.com, they have a great story written by uh, Mr. Vassiver, Xavier Vassiver. And he says this year, the Chinese military has the largest Navy in the world as of 2021. And I want you to take a close look at this photo here. They're building very American style ships. They're building carriers. This is the type two right here, essentially a Kuznetsov knockoff. But the type three and type four are not Russian knockoffs. They're American knockoffs. They're making American style aircraft carriers after this one. Type three and type four 
our uh, type three, I think just got launched, I think. Uh, but type four is under construction and they look a lot like our modern aircraft carriers and they have similar capabilities. And then look at this big amphib ship back here. Yeah, this is like one of our LHAs or LHDs. It's certainly, you know, an amphibious so support vessel. So they're building American, an American style Navy. And as of this year, they now have more ships than we have. And we cannot assume that just because we have fewer ships that our ships are better, therefore it makes up the difference. They're not slowing down on their construction. They're going to keep building these just because they now have numerically more ships than we do. Doesn't mean that, Oh, they've crossed the finish line. They're done. That is not the case. If anything, all evidence suggests that they're going to maintain this pace indefinitely. They don't show any signs whatsoever of slowing down. Now, let's read what Xavier says, since he's the actual expert here. He writes, the U.S. DOD's 2021 China Military Power Report, PLAN is the largest Navy in the world, unquote. Uh, these, this year's report provides a baseline assessment of the department's top paced challenge and charts, charts the mature, maturation of the People's Liberation Army, PLA. The report accounts for the PRC's evolving national strategy and outlines strategic objectives uh, driving the PLA's defense policy. I've read this report because they published an unclassified version of it. It's very lengthy, but very good. I might have talked about it last week. It might be my last news video. You guys have to go look at that one. Uh, but let's read this little clip from it here. It says the People's Liberation Army Navy or PLAN has numerically the largest Navy in the world with an overall battle force of approximately 355 ships and submarines, including approximately more than 140 major surface combatants. As of 2020, PLAN is largely composed of modern multi-role platforms, and that's really important. They do air defense, ASW, you know, surface to surface. They do a multitude of those roles. They're not just, you know, one trick ponies that they need to work together. They can, they can do multiple missions at the same time, very similar to our early Burke in terms of mission capability. Uh, in the near term, PLAN will have the capability to conduct long range precision strikes against land targets from its submarine and surface combatants using land attack cruise missiles, notably enhancing the PRC's global protection projection capabilities. The uh, PRC is enhanced its anti-submarine warfare, ASW, capabilities and competencies to protect PLAN's aircraft carriers and ballistic missile submarines. So this is a very important graphic I want you to look at. They outline exactly what's at their three major naval bases. I tweeted this out over the weekend so you can get a closer look at this, but look at how many ships they have in each of their three major bases. And they have um, Northern, Eastern, and Southern uh, theaters. That's how they break it up along their coastline here. Now, the big thing is, is uh, King Dao and Zhang Ji down here at the bottom, Zhang, Zhen Zhang, um, th this is their ballistic missile submarines and their ballistic missile submarines uh, with the new um, the DF, what, what, what are the new ballistic missile is, uh, they can reach mainland United States from the South China Sea and the Yellow Sea. They don't need to leave their home waters, essentially, to achieve their nuclear deterrence missions. And then on top of that, look at the sheer number of uh, ships they have in each one of these bases. I'll be posting this uh, photo again on social media so, if you guys, so you guys can look at it if you want to. Or you can just go to navalnews.com and look at it yourself. It's really impressive. Uh, this, is, this is a very capable 21st century Navy that we should not underestimate. Uh, do not think just because Chinese made it that it's not any good. That's certainly, that would be a huge... Uh, mistake and misunderstanding of their capability. If you think that um, let's read the, the takeaways from this got three takeaways, real simple. Uh, the people's Republic of China commissions a first domestic built aircraft carrier in 2019 and its first Renhai crew uh, class cruiser in 2020. The PRC expects its second domestically built aircraft carrier in 2024. That's the type four right there. So this must be type three and this is type four. They're, they're not copying the Russians anymore. They're not getting their parts from Russia anymore. They're, they're building it all themselves. Now they're completely self-efficient from the lowest Corvette to these new aircraft carriers. Uh, they're essentially the United States of the Far East is the way I look at them. In 2020, this is point two, People's Republic of China launched the second Yushin class amphibious transport assault ship. That's that's what I uh, that's the ship I pointed out to you in the beginning here. Uh, after launching its first in 2019, the first class 
its first class of large deck amphibious warship. A third hull is under construction. So why do you think they're building these amphibious class ships? You know, what are they going to invade? Point three, then near term, the PLAN, People's Liberate, uh, Army Navy, uh, will have the capability of conducting long range precision strikes against land targets from its submarine and surface combat forces using land attack cruise missiles, much like the United States has been doing for decades, notably enhancing the PRC's global projection capabilities. The PRC is also enhancing its anti submarine ASW inventory and training to protect its aircraft carriers. So those are the three major things. They now have amphibious operation capability. They have first world order uh, aircraft carriers that are domestically built, and they have improved global strike projection capabilities, including ASW capabilities. This is everything the United States Navy uh, works to maintain every, every day. Every day we train is to keep these capabilities. And guess who else has them now? As of starting in 2019, really, uh, but they're getting better every year and they're getting more of these ships every year. So, you know, naval combat with them would be an absolute mess. Uh, he goes into force structure. If you want to read this piece, I encourage you to go to it. It's rather lengthy and very detailed. It talks about their ballistic submarine force and, uh, their increased inventory, surface combatants. This is that Type 55 destroyer. This thing is huge. It's like 13,000 tons. Uh, it's it's really big. So I, I would classify it as like a um, a cruiser just, just by tonnage, but they call it a destroyer. There's probably some treaty reason for, for that classification. It's absolutely insane. Here's that amphibious warfare ship. They're building a third one of these um, because reasons. And then finally, this is the old school. This is the Type 2 down here, uh, Kuznetsov copy. And they're building uh, right now two more of these. But they look like American ones. They actually have catapults and stuff. Uh, auxiliary support ships, they, they understand the importance of at-sea replenishment to keep the ships at sea for long periods of time, uh, just like the Americans do. They're essentially copying the Americans and the UK Royal Navy's capability of long-term deployments. It, I would not be shocked in the future, in uh, however many years, I don't even want to put a time on it, that they deploy off the coast of the United States, much like we deploy off the coast of South China right, right now. Um, just, just to say, Hey, we can do it too. And you know what, because of the freedom of navigation, they're absolutely allowed to do that. But with ships like this, they can do six, the nine month de deployments around the globe. So don't be surprised to see something like this off the coast of San Francisco in the future, because they have the capability now. And, uh, let's see, I'll leave you with this. This is the new ballistic missile submarine that they have. And it's not so much the new ballistic missile submarine as it is the, the, the new missile that they've built for it. This thing, the JL-2, I thought they had a newer one than that. Anyway, it can hit the United States from the Yellow Sea and South China Sea. As soon as they throw the lines off at port, they can just go submerge and they're ready to strike. They don't need to go into the Pacific. And they're building a lot of nuclear weapons right now to to uh, put on these on these submarines uh this piece comes from joseph uh Therthick of the of the war zone magazine i would encourage you to go and read this piece i believe we might have already covered this piece uh ourselves all right here are the two bastions if you will if there was ever armed conflict with china with any nation not just the united states they would put their ballistic missile submarines in the south china sea and in the yellow sea up here and they'd be able to cover all of Asia and still strike North America uh, from these two locations. The point is they don't need Taiwan. They don't need to go through these choke points into the Philippine Sea to accomplish their, their mission anymore. They've got the new long range rockets that that do that for them. And as a final point, I want to remind everybody of this. We've covered this once before. They are building enormous, uh, simply mind bogglingly huge fields of um, nuclear ballistic missile silos in China. This is one of two sites that are under construction right now with dozens and dozens of silos. And the idea is, is while at the rate that they're building nuclear weapons and rocket motors for them, they could fill these silos, but they don't need to. They could put one or two, but for targeting reasons, we would not know which one of these actually has a nuclear 
you know, weapon in it? Which one do you target for, for, for deterrence? Uh, you know, do we have enough weapons to target all of these silos? They could build, you know, a third and fourth field like this that are hundreds of miles in, in length uh, with dozens of silos and not need to really do anything with them other than pretend that there is a weapon beneath the silo missile hatch. Um, so it's not just at sea capability, guys. It's, you know, land capability, land launch. They also have uh, the transport erector launchers. So they have the mobile ability that North Korea has. That's how North Korea got their mobile ability to launch these intermediate uh, ballistic missiles as well. They've got the whole kit is my point. Uh, they're, they're already there. It's, it's too late. We've lost the window to stop this. Now we just need to manage it. You know, what does China want? You know, how do you avoid conflict with a nation that has this kind of capability? Um, and to be fair, China has never directly threatened the United States with like invasion or anything. So it's not like they're wanting war. They, they have their own internal goals that they're managing. And so we just need to manage our, uh, you know, appearance to them and, and not instigate an unnecessary conflict, I think. But this is just a quick summary of, of what they have. Their, their, their capability is intense. If you were to follow this up, I would recommend you go to navalnews.com first and read this article. It's very detailed. It goes beyond the scope of what we have time for today. It's written by Xavier Vassiver uh, from the 5th of November, DOD's 2021 uh, power report. If you want, you can download this power, uh, this, the, the, this report. It's like a hundred some pages. It's really long. And it's the actual report to Congress that's been re redacted. So it's unclassified and it's, it's mind blowing. China's here guys. And, uh, we just have to work with them now. There's no, there's no pushing them back in my opinion. Okay. So that's the end of the naval news segment. Let's see what, uh, chat has to say you guys. Um, I don't think anybody that follows this channel is shocked or surprised at this news. And, uh, you know, maybe it's not even bad news. It's not really good or bad. It's just, hey, these are the facts on the ground. And now, now we got to deal with the reality that we have. Uh, let's see. Hayden says, will this stream be available on VOD? It will be on YouTube, sir. YouTube, yes. Uh, anybody else? I, I don't blame you guys for not commenting on this um, because it can be a very tacky, you know, subject. We don't want to, you know, feed the trolls. That's not what we're doing here. We're just talking about the reality of the world that, that, that we live in. Uh, you stated that they build too many ships for maintenance. Yeah. So that's the thing is eventually these ships are going to need to be maintained. Uh, but the first maintenance period is going to be between for just, and we're not talking refueling, just like, you know, regular maintenance, three to five years before maintenance. So, uh, if they started building these in 2019, commissioning them in 2020. So by 2025, we'll see them start rotating them into the dry docks or into the shipyards anyway, not necessarily the dry docks, by the way, and see how well they maintain this fleet. Uh, but we won't know that for a couple of years. Can they continue to build at this pace and maintain at the same time? Um, China thinks they can. They certainly do. Uh, and we'll see. Maybe they can. Great question. And uh, good point. Bringing up what I had said previously. Absolutely. Uh, see, so Seawolf says they're in economic troubles. So one way to get out of economic troubles, because we did this in the 1930s, uh, the United States did this, is we created government jobs. A lot of government jobs. You know, people were building all sorts of things from the interstate system to, um, well, that was after the 30s, but whatever, government jobs. And what these are, building these ships and maintaining them, are government jobs. So people that don't have jobs uh, and don't have any skills, they can go and the state will train them, uh, house them, feed them. They work in the shipyards. And that person now has a job. He has an income. He has a life. He has a place to live. And so it gives the Chinese, the average citizen that, that works in these fields, you know, a, a career. So one way of, you know, combating that economy question that you bring up is to simply build more of this instead of building houses and apartments like they have been for doing for decades. And they have this real estate bubble that I think you're referring to. Why not build ships and maintain them? Uh, let's see. John Blur says, here's another angle. Are they trying to cash into S trying to cash into assets and jobs or try to float their economy? Yeah, that's kind of what I was saying. 
So I think you're on the same page, John. He says, and you can always sell off old ships and weapons to other countries. Yep. And do you know who would buy these ships? Especially say this aircraft carrier right here, Iran. Iran would buy this in a heartbeat because the UN sanctions on Iran limit the oil sales from that com from, from that country. They don't limit, uh, well, they do limit some weapon sales, but I don't think there's a provision in there for aircraft carriers, you know, unless you would call this a weapon, I suppose. That would probably fall under that. Yeah. But you're right. Uh, build these ships, use them for a couple years, and whenever they need to be maintained, sell them. That happens here in the United States with uh, cars and planes. Like if you were to buy a secondhand Cessna or helicopter, it probably is at its 50,000, you know, 50,000, 500 hour um, operating you know, limit where you need to do that 500 hour maintenance that cost as much as the plane costs. Yeah. So yeah, you run these into the ground like it's a rental and then you sell it. Uh, I would not be surprised if China has, has that in mind. That's a very good point that I wish I'd thought of first, but good job, John. You nailed it. I think, I think you're onto something there. Albino says China has the equipment, but they are, are they competent with the equipment? Uh, they, they have not been competent. I'll, I'll give you that. They operate their submarines, especially like a bunch of noobs, but they're getting better guys. Uh, the fact that they're doing it uh, is giving them experience. And now we're starting to see some of that experience pay off. I mean, they, they've had submarines to some extent for a long time, but now they have a large number of ships and submarines and they're putting them in the sea fully crewed and getting at sea experience. And it won't be long. It won't be, it doesn't take a lot of years to develop a generation of sailors that can then pass on that experience to a new generation. Yeah. The, the, that's already happening. They're already getting better. So while we can point right now, Hey, they're still operating like they're brand new sailors. They're green. Uh, we can't say that for very much longer. Uh, Apricot says uh, with the rails, they can simulate the Burks maneuvering in and around the carrier uh, and test the radar image during the routes. That's kind of the point I think of that, of that rail system that we were talking about. Cause if you notice it does go right by the carrier as you're saying, Helipilot says, remember they fairly new in terms, in terms to have a strong economy. So they're still learning. Yeah. Their economy is a bit of a mess right now. They're, they're trying to figure that out. And uh, I think from an outside point of view, we want them to figure that out. I think one of the worst things that could happen for the entire world, not just the United States is if China's economy fails you know, and not just resets like ours did in 2008, but if it actually crumbled, uh, they, that would be very dangerous. Look at what happened to Russia when the Soviet Union collapsed. America freaked the F out about the nuclear weapons because the only people in charge of the nuclear weapons were the military forces, including the generals and majors in charge of those storage facilities. And we were concerned that a corrupt general in order to make money would sell either technology or the actual, you know, material, visible material itself to anybody who would pay him money. Uh, as far as I know, that never happened. So kudos to the, you know, people who were in charge of that uh, and, 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 and didn't let that happen. But we could have a similar scenario if Chinese economy completely collapsed. Nobody wants that. And um, that's a good argument against war. Because if they did go to war, it's highly likely that their economy would take a severe hit. Very likely. Because uh, there's a lot of their exports go to countries that would be on the opposite side of that conflict. Because they don't have a lot of friends in the region anyway. The, Iran and them kind of get along. They're developing their relationship with Russia a little bit. Of course, North Korea is a bit like a, a tick on the ass of a dog. Uh, so they have them. But they don't have too, too many other people. Uh, let's see, I can't read your name. Oh, Johnny says, have you seen the damage to the Connecticut? Uh, no, uh, I have not. And, uh, we're not going to get into that anyway. So that's the end of the Naval news segment. Uh, China in, uh, 2021, they now have the largest Navy in the world. Congratulations to them. Let's see what they do with it. All right. We'll be right back. Don't go anywhere. 